Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. And Tina's going to lead us in a song right now. And I want to encourage you, just worship the Lord during that song. You can stand up and worship and, and just, just, you know, spend these next few minutes uh, worshiping the Lord. And then we'll come back and, uh, and do our service. Amen.
Oh, Lord, we bless you. We honor you. We magnify you. Lord, we choose you over everything else, God, because you've chosen us. Lord, we bless you today. Lord, I pray for the folks here in this service as well as those that are watching on Facebook Live. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just flow like a river through our lives for your glory, and that you would accomplish your purposes and desires and your plan for each of our lives. Lord, we yield ourselves. We submit ourselves, Lord, to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Well, we want to uh, talk about uh, this morning, something out of the Bible. How many of you find that as, as a big surprise? Wow, it's 11-16. We went a ways. Uh, title of today's message is Looking for a Loophole. Looking for a Loophole. How many of you know uh, sometimes we do that? Uh, uh, take a contract or send contracts to a legal expert to see what could be done. You know, people look for loopholes sometimes. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Luke 10. If you want to turn over there with me. Looking for a loophole. Luke 10, verse 25. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. You guys look so good. So good. Praise the Lord. Amen. I have the most beautiful, handsome church in the whole county. Best people. Best people. Everybody wants our people. You are awesome. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. <clears throat> And uh, behold, a certain lawyer stood up, tempting Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He, he wanted to tempt Jesus. He was trying to get Jesus to say something that would, would not be okay in their Jewish culture. And when we think of a lawyer today, we think of an attorney. Uh, we don't see them as a religious figure. But in Jesus' days... The, the lawyers, the scribes, the Pharisees, the priests, they were all a part of the temple, and, and they were experts in the law of Moses. And they saw so he was a lawyer, and they helped make decisions for families and for property disputes. All these things were, every one of those laws, everything that came up for dispute was measured against the word of God. And, and you may or may not be aware of it, but most laws in our land have their roots uh, in, in scriptural laws and principles. However, as we well know, some of that stuff has gotten perverted and changed. But the founding fathers and so much, many of our laws and principles are things taught in the Word of God. So this individual was trying to trick Jesus or trying to catch him in his words or to have some reason uh, to find fault with him. How many of you know sometimes people want to find fault with you? And how many of you know sometimes you're guilty of wanting to find fault with others? When we find fault with an individual, we can dismiss them as not important or irrelevant or, you know, somebody I don't have to listen to. When we find fault with somebody, then we are okay with our behavior not being appropriate towards that individual or in general. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? When we find fault with a group of people or an individual, then we somehow feel justified that we can act differently towards them. But that's not what the Bible teaches. No matter what other people do, we're still held to the same standards of God's Word. We must do what we do for the Lord and live for Him in accordance to the teachings of the Word of God, no matter if we do find fault in other people. It can never be an excuse. And so he said to Jesus, or, or Jesus said to him, rather, uh, what is written in the law? How do you read it? How do you read? How many of you know we don't all read things the same way sometimes? We have our own bias we put in there. And this man answered and said to Jesus, Well, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all the heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said unto him, Jesus speaking on him, Jesus said to the warrior, uh, Thou hast answered right. This do and you shall live. So that guy answered really well. He done a great job. And, and uh, you know, he, he, uh, he answered the question. You know, Jesus said, well, how do you read it? And so this man told him, this man was, was legally correct in what he said. Legally correct. But how many of you know sometimes we look for a loophole, 
way out. We try to fudge a little. Anybody ever fudged a little? I've got a lady that's done my taxes for over 30 years. And when, we, when she first began to do taxes, when I sat down with this lady, and she runs an office, and you know, it's a part of a, a larger company. And, and I told her, I said, I'm not interested in gray areas. I'm not interested in gray areas. I want to pay what I need to pay, and I, I don't want what's not mine. I don't want to give extra, but I'm not interested in gray areas. How I many of you know some people, when it comes to taxes, like to live in some sort of a gray area? Can I fudge a little here? But it carries over into other parts of our lives. Sometimes people want to get by with the least amount of effort. We want to just slide through life. We're looking for a way to beat the system or work the system. Sometimes we live our lives in legalism like this guy. He, he, he wanted you know, this answer from Jesus. What can I do that I might have eternal life? And, and, and he was looking for some simple uh, you know, list of things to do. And that leads us to another category of people with legalism. Comes those people that want to check off the list. I've done my devotion. I've done my prayer. I fed one hungry person. I gave somebody a toboggan that I wouldn't wear anyway. But anyway, you know, I, I want to check off things that I've done. And then I think I'm going to be okay with God. And that makes me a, a good person. Uh, sometimes this sort of attitude of, of loopholes looking for a way to get back leads to principles over people. Principles over people. Now, I believe in principles. If we have good moral principles, if we if we are a principled person, then that'll help us do the right things. It'll affect every area of our life. But sometimes we put those things over human beings. How many of you know that human beings aren't really made in a cookie cutter shape? There are differences, not just in appearances, but but in upbringing and. In, in culture and, and uh, in, in who we are as an individual and, and the way we look and the way that we, uh, uh, you know, think about things, the way we're educated, the way we were brought up. And, and principles and rules are not more important than people. I don't say we need to throw all the rules out, but people are more important and we need to look for a way to help people. God gave guidelines and laws and commandments in the scriptures so that we would have boundaries to help us know how to uh, take care of each other. Because man needed that, didn't he? He did. What was Cain's response to Abel in the garden? Uh, Abel brought what kind of sacrifice to God? What did he bring? What did Abel bring? What was it? A lamb. He brought a, a, a sacrifice of an animal, a lamb. And what did Cain bring? He brought a fruit basket. And, and somebody said, well, what difference does that matter? That's what's their occupation. Well, uh, a lamb meant something had to die. A lamb meant that Abel understood that my sins are horrible, and so an innocent lamb will die. That lamb is a representation of Christ. Cain, on the other hand, thought, the other hand thought well, what I do is not that bad. A fruit basket will cover it. There's no sacrifice. I mean, when I eat a banana, it doesn't scream. You know, there, there's no sacrifice of the fruit per se, but an animal involves something to do with the person giving it. You, you know, you make a sacrifice. You, you got your hands on that, and you're making that sacrifice. You feel the life, and you feel the life glow, go. And it is bloody, and it can be messy. And you see, it was symbolic of Christ dying on the cross. And how many of you know Christ's death for me and you was not clean and neat and, and sterile and easily packaged? No, he was a man, born of a woman just like everybody else, lived 33 years sinlessly, 30 years apparently as a carpenter's son working in a carpenter shop or something. We really don't know anything from age 12 to 30, but we do know that in the fullness of time, he came. And John declared, this is he, the one that sent me to preach the coming of the Lord. This is the one that the Spirit descended upon. He is the Messiah. And Jesus lived those three and a half years. And they weren't easy years. They were difficult times. People attacked him and ridiculed him, tried to murder him on numerous occasions. Oh, my goodness, criticized from family and from religion. And the government didn't care for him either too much because they're always concerned with somebody that has power. 
Jesus had followers, some days 15,000, and some days just 12, but one of them would outright betray him, sell him for 30 pieces of silver. Yeah, it, it, it's our response to these things. Christianity and people and, and, and loving the world and making a difference, it isn't cut and dry. It's about accepting people and trying to work where the differences are and, and make a difference. And, and this uh, lawyer of the law, he wanted to know, what can I do? I want something I can just do. How many of you remember the young rich ruler who came and had a lot of money? And he said the same thing. What must I do to have eternal life? And I think he was looking to write a check. How much? How much can I give you today so I have eternal life? Yeah, we have to be careful. Sometimes... Uh, we look for loopholes. We want to control our relationship with God instead of surrendering our relationship to God. What you think about that? God, I'll, I'll, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do, except I'm not willing to do this or that. I'm, I'm not even good at that, God. I, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable with that, Lord, but is it what he said to do? Is it his word? Is it something the Holy Spirit's told you? How, how many of you know sometimes we, we treat God like we can maybe outsmart him? That's what this lawyer tried to do. He, he wanted some easy little answer. And then this last little category here is uh, sometimes we look for loopholes when we're trying to do works over grace. Now, I believe in works. Ephesians 2, 5 says... Even when we were dead in our sins, how many of you know today that even if you're born again, blood fault, loving Jesus with all your heart, there was a time in your life when you were dead in your sins. Dead without Christ, no hope in the world, lost. If you, if you know Jesus today, your past has that lostness in it. And there are many uh, here or even on the Facebook Live, and you're still in that condition. You don't know Christ as your Savior, but you can. While we were still in our sins, while we were dead in our sins, and we're dead in our sins, dead to God is separated from Him. That's what death is. Adam and Eve didn't die when they ate the fruit physically, but they were separated from God. They no longer had that fellowship and union that they had with Him before. When we were dead in our sins, He's made us alive together in Christ, for by grace you are saved. And He's raised us up together and made us set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show his great, exceeding richness of his grace in his likeness towards us through Christ. That he might show the exceeding richness of his grace in his likeness towards us through Christ. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, and not of works, lest any man boast. You know, if, we, if we're doing it, if we're looking for loopholes, we're looking to be able to say, I've done this much, I can boast. So works don't save you, but works are not dismissed from the life of a believer. Ephesians 2.10, the next verse says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, on to good works. You were created for good works. When you got born again, God had a lot of things for you to do. They're not what saved you, but it is something you were created for. Don't try to use the loophole of grace. I'm covered by grace. I'll do what I want to do. I won't bother learning the word. I won't be responsible because I don't know. I'm just going to love Jesus and go on, and that's impossible. You can't love him and not obey him, Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. No, works don't save you, but but when you get born again, works are a part of your life. So we go back to Luke 10. Well, let me read. I think I might have missed the verse. Yeah, verse 28, Jesus said on him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. <clears throat> and uh, so then, Jesus didn't say all that stuff I said in between. And then, uh, in verse uh, 29, this man being willing to justify himself. How many of you know we're far more willing to justify ourselves than other people? If we look at people doing something we don't understand or don't know about or not experience it, we're quick to condemn them and, and we're quick to be justified in our position. This is who I am, this is what I am, and, and we don't see the needs of other people. But Jesus is all about the needs of other people. 
How many of you know that he's all about your needs and my needs? That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, the scripture says in Romans that we were the enemy of God. Romans 5, 10, we were the enemies of God before we were saved. I never was the enemy of God. He says you are. Who am I going to believe, you or him? Before you're born again, you are at war with God, whether you know it or not. You're in rebellion against the King of kings and Lord of lords without Christ. Very important. So this man, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Now, the man gave the answer. He said, It's loving God first and your neighbor is yourself. And Jesus said, Go do that and live. And he said, Well, wait just a minute. Who is my neighbor? I tell you, that question began in the beginning when Cain said, Am I my brother's keeper? What responsibility does a believer have for the lost or his neighbor or his brother and sister in Christ? They're really all in the same. And so this man said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Because he wanted to be self-justified in his prejudice, in his disagreements, in not having anything to do with other people because he was a good Jew clean, and he couldn't come in contact with those who were not of his particular belief. And that's sort of what they believed in Jesus' day. They were very particular, very legalistic. And Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from, Jer from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves which stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, and by chance there came a certain priest that way, and when he saw this man that had been beaten and was bloody and left half dead, he passed by on the other side. He moved over and walked further away from that man so that he didn't have to have anything to do with him. He saw the need. It was obvious, but he didn't want to get involved. He was busy. He had an appointment. He had something else he needed to do. It's just not good for me to get involved with what I don't know about. I'm just going to turn and look the other way. And he went around that man. Was he a neighbor to that man? Was he a neighbor to that man by avoiding him? Was he being a good neighbor by that man by not caring about him or tending to him? Now, if you ask that, <clears throat> if you ask that priest, do you love God, what would he have said? Oh, yeah, I love God. I'm a priest. Don't you realize that? I got the robe and everything. Just last week, I made 500 sacrifices at the temple, and, and I, I served up the showbread, and I lit the candles, and, and I, I covered another man's seven-day shift and purified myself and stayed from my home and sacrificed so much for God to be a priest. I could have made more money farming with my dad, maybe. Yeah, I love God. But he had a problem. He didn't love that man. He didn't love that man at all. And uh, <clears throat> so, so then the scripture says, and likewise also a Levite, that when he was at that place, came and looked at that man and passed by on the other way. Apparently, he saw him, and, and he looked at him, and he got a little bit closer. And I don't know how long this man's been laying there, but he's laying there long enough for a couple of juriers, or passerbyers, to see him. And he looked at him, and he also passed by on the other side. What's a Levite? A Levite's the one who works in the temple. He's not the priest, but he serves in the temple. He's a religious individual. He's a deacon, if you please. He's, he has some sort of religious responsibilities in the temple and to the priest. And, and there was a great number of priests and Levites in the temple in Jerusalem, or the you know, place of worship in Jerusalem. And this man also went by. But then verse 33 tells another story. It says there was a certain Samaritan. Can you all say that with me? Samaritan. Say it again, Samaritan. What is a Samaritan? What is that? Is he a, is he a Jewish person? No, he's a, he's a, he's a half-breed. He's half-Jewish and half-Canaanite going back before the time of Ezra, or, or Nehemiah going back before that time. And they, they were not liked by the Jews at all. When the Jews rebuilt Jerusalem, they would not allow them to help work with them on the temple or anything because they were not fit. But they still were the children of Jacob. They still were the descendants of Jacob. 
And they lived in another city outside of Jerusalem. And they had their own place to worship in the mountain. And many of you will remember that Jesus stopped at the well outside of Samaria. And there, a lady going at midday to get water, probably because she couldn't go in the morning and evening because of her lifestyle. Because she had been married five times and was living with a guy and nobody should talk to a woman like that. And she said, how is it you being a Jew are even talking to me about water or anything? And the disciples came back later and they looked and said, they looked and thought he was talking to her. But the Bible said they didn't say anything. After a little while, they learned to keep their mouth shut. <laughs> when they didn't understand what he was doing, somebody said, Say nothing every time you say something. We get another sermon. We'll never get out of here if he starts preaching. Oh, that's what you all said. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. And this guy that is a Samaritan, he's on a journey. And he came to where that man was in verse 33, and he saw him. And he had something on him that didn't. He, he had something when he saw that man that didn't have to do with loot, loot bowls or doing the least that I can or fudging a little or trying to get by or being a legalist or just checking off the boxes. When he looked at that man, he saw him as another person and he had compassion on him. He thought, oh my goodness, this guy is suffering. Was it a risk? Yes. Was it dangerous? Yes. Or could whoever beat that man might still be there. He might be using the body of that man to draw somebody so he can beat and rob that person as well. But he saw him and he had compassion on him. What is our attitude towards people that are different than us? What is our attitude towards people who don't think like we think or act like we act or walk like we walk? What is our attitude? Do we spend our time trying to justify who we are and negate who everybody else is? You know, God is a little different than us. The scripture tells us that God is looking forward to a time when the kingdom comes in heaven and it will be made of every tongue, every tribe, every nation, every people, every race. God sees things a whole lot different than us. How many of you know that everybody that's not born again is just a lost sinner? Just like you and I. We weren't born saints. If you're born again today, you weren't born saved. You were born lost. You suffer from the greatest disease of mankind. You were a sinner, separated from God, born in sin because of that of sin. And Christ came to redeem us from that no matter who we are or were. It's all the same. I promise you God doesn't love some people more than others in the context of who they are or where they're from. And so this man saw him and had compassion. Verse 34, he went to him and he bound up his wounds. He poured in the oil and the wine. He sent him on his own animal. And he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. You notice he didn't just take him somewhere and drop him off. The scripture says he took care of that man. He nursed him. He bound up the wounds. He, he treated him with whatever he had available to treat him with. He took care of him. When do we take responsibility and take care of other people? If it's just not, you know, our immediate family. Sometimes we don't think about other people. Who is Jesus telling a story about? He's telling a story about who my neighbor is. The lawyer trying to justify himself said, well, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus tells this story. And the next day when the Samaritan had to leave, he took out some extra money and he gave it to the man that ran the hotel that he was at. And he said, you take care of him. And whatever it costs more than this, when I come again, I will repay it. He not only took responsibility to do with what he could do in that moment to help that person, spent the night taking care of him, but when he had to leave, he left funds to take care of him and said, I'll pay the balance when I come back. How many of you know that's a little too close for most people? He didn't say up to $10 or up to three fifty dollars or up to five bills or he could stay here for two days after that, I'm not paying. How many of you know he took a risk, right? He took a risk. I'll pay the man's bill, whatever that might be. <clears throat> I will repay. And then verse 36, Jesus said, Which now of these three do you think was a neighbor unto the man that fell among the thieves? Which one was being a good neighbor? Was it the priest? The religious priest? Was it the Levite? The religious man, the Jewish person that worked in the temple, 
Or was it a Samaritan, one whom a Jew would not speak to, a different race of people? It's interesting, isn't it? He said, which one is the name of And the lawyer said, he that showed mercy on the man. And then Jesus said to that man, the lawyer, closing up the loophole, go and do likewise. You go and treat other people the same way. The man's question was, how do I inherit eternal life? What do I do to get born again? And Jesus said the two greatest commandments of all. And that man said to love God with everything within you and to love your neighbor in the same way. In another place, referring to this story, Jesus said on these two commandments hang all the law. In fact, Jesus said these two commandments are one and the same. They're one and the same. I'm going to, to borrow in a moment from last week's sermon. How many of you remember everything I said last week? Every scripture verse, every point, everybody knows exactly everything. So you'll certainly know in a moment when I use that same segment again that, oh yeah, I heard that last week word for word, Pastor. I know you guys are, you're so good. But uh, let me tell you something. Loving God and loving everybody else on the planet, including your enemies. Who was it that said we, we might want to probably, if we could, some way or another, love our enemies? Who, who said that? Who said it? Who said love your enemies? Yeah, Jesus did, didn't he? You think he was kidding? You think that that could come up again in our lives sometime when Jesus looks at us and says, well, you didn't love your enemies. I mean, could that ever come up? Is it important to love your enemies? Who are the enemies? Well, it's somebody that we don't like right now. Right now. Somebody that you don't care for. Somebody that's in your mind and in your thinking that you'd rather not be around. Somebody that uh, you say, well, I, don't, I love them, but I don't like them. That's your enemy. It might be your spouse. <laughs> well, you laughed about George. I can see how you that ask. <laughs> Those kids, they love each other. When one of them gets in the car with me to go somewhere, and we haven't done that in months, have we? But when one of them goes with me, I don't get out of their subdivision area before they ask about the other one. They, I wonder what Nadine's doing. Well, she's probably still on the porch. <laughs> you know, we've been gone nine seconds. <laughs> In 50 years of marriage, they just haven't got time to each other, praise God. And maybe she'll, she'll want to know about yours, want to know about yours. And George Law will be on the roof. Because <laughs> when he, she leaves, he gets into stuff. But still, they just, they just love each other. They love each other. We're called to love our enemies. It's easy to love people that love us. It's easy to do good to those that do good to us. Our enemies are the person who won't spit on you when you're on fire. It's the person that sets you on fire. It's the one that hates you and persecutes you and says all manner of evil and despises you. How many of you know this is all Jesus' teachings? It's in red if you've got a red letter edition of the Bible. It's not phony. It's not made up. And for those who say, and I have heard this, well, that all ended at the cross. You've got to be kidding. What Jesus, when he died, that was over with? It was just the beginning. Before the cross, we didn't have the power to do it. But after the cross, we can love our enemies. Amen? Amen. So whoever it is you think about, whoever it is that you're not fond of, person that you don't want to sit next to, eat with, talk to, be around the one that you avoid whenever it's possible, even if you act civil when you're there, even if you're really nice to their face, but inside is like, I know it's the people that aren't here. It's the empty chairs today that have that problem. That's why they're not here. They're at home thinking about you hypocrites that came to church today. That's sometimes what they think, and we're called to love them. It's not true, but it's what they think, and we're called to love them because they're complaining. We don't want to be guilty of complaining, whining, and fussing, do we? We don't want to give to them what they gave to us. We want to love them. And the world a lot of times does believe the church is hypocritical. Sometimes we are. Is that right or not? Sometimes we're not living up to the teachings of a person who profess to be the absolute owner, master, redeemer of our lives. And so there is some hypocrisy. We're working on it, aren't we? 
We ask the world to forgive us. Forgive me. So, wow, when we ever going to end, Pastor? This loving God and loving your neighbors yourself, they're inseparably tied together. Every place it comes up, they're tied together. Whether it's a colon mark or the second is like it under the first statement of Jesus, they're tied together. We're to love God unreservedly with everything that you are and everything that you have. And you're to love the neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. 1 John 3, 17. Whosoever has this world's goods and see his brother have need and shuts up his heart of compassion for him, from him, how does the love of God dwell in that person? When you see somebody suffering or somebody poor, or homeless person, and you say, get a job. Get a job like me. You shut up your heart of compassion. How many of you know God can look at us a lot of times and say, do better? Eugene, figure it out yourself, Eugene. Well, I tell you, God's good. I believe in working. If you know me, you know I do. But I tell you what, we need to love people and help people. Sometimes people are suffering. They have different points of views than we do. We don't have a right to love, to hate them. We must love them. We must have compassion upon people. If we're going to love God, uh, we've got to love people. You can't not love people and, and love God. They're inseparable. It's impossible. If we have the means to help, we ought to help. Remember the first church in the book of Acts? They believers got together and sold stuff to help people. They shared. First John 4 20. If any man say, I love God, and hates his brother. And hatred means a strong preference against. Doesn't have to be killing type of hate. It's just simply, ugh, you don't like it. Anybody ever felt that way? Anybody here ever hated somebody, disliked somebody strongly, preferred not to be with that person under any circumstances? Would rather walk than ride in the car with them? <laughs> Get out of the fishing boat, swim to the bank. That would upset my father-in-law one time. He thought about doing it, but it was February. He really railed on me hard that morning. He was a great helper in developing patience. Yeah, Katie knows. Faith knows. <laughs> Jack's learning. If any man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Who's the liar here? God or the brother or the one who doesn't? The one who hates, isn't it? If I love God, if I love God and I hate somebody, I'm a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he can see, how can he love God whom he has not seen? That's what John said. You can't love people you see. You know way you can really love God that you cannot see. 1 John 4, 21. And this commandment have we from him. He that loves God loves his brother also. Well, how does that tie into loving yourself? The greatest thing you could ever do for yourself is to know Christ. You understand that? The greatest thing you could ever do in your life for yourself is is to come to the saving knowledge of Christ and wholly dedicate your life to Him and live your life unreservedly all the days of your life without ever putting your hand to the plow and looking back, simply going forward without reservations or restrictions of God's call or choice on your life. That's the greatest thing you ever do for yourself because it ends up in heaven and it ends up with reward and it ends up blessed before the throne of the Father. And the greatest thing, if you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, the greatest thing you can ever do for your neighbor is to live in such a way to share the good news, to show such compassion and mercy and kindness and love towards those that despitefully use you, that they would turn to Christ, that you would have a reason for the hope that's in you, that you would live in such a way they would say, I don't know who you are or what you have, but I need you in my life. That's the greatest thing. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. So your responsibility is to love God as yourself, serve him, and then do everything you can, loving the people in the world, whether you know them or not yet, whether you've met them or not, whether they're different than you or not, loving them in such a way that you share the good news at all costs. You do everything you can in word and deed, in action, everything you can to help them know the Lord. 1 John 3, 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Love is not what we say. Love is an action motivated by truth. Jesus is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. 
God's word is truth. We need to love people in real, tangible, sacrificial, expensive, costly ways sometimes. That's what the Samaritan did. He took of his own time and effort. He got his hands messy. He took care of a person he didn't know, probably of a different race, and loved him. But nonetheless, to that lawyer, Jesus used the Samaritan as a hero. And in the lawyer's eyes, in the Jews of Jesus' day, eyes, a Samaritan could not be anything but bad. Jesus deals with that throughout the scriptures, the New Testament, the Old Testament. We need to love people. Let's close right now. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your holy word. And I pray, God, that somehow you would take these words of mine and that they would prick the hearts because of your scripture, Lord, that is placed throughout there. That the reading of your word to people, God, that it would touch and transform us, God. Lord, that we would begin to love you more than anything else in the world, above everything else. Lord, that we would love you with all that we are, with all that we say, with all that we do. God, and we would love our neighbors like we love ourselves, that we would serve you first, first and foremost, and that we would set an example and preach the gospel and love people and do things for people that would attract them to you, that we want to know the God that we know. Lord, and in doing so, we would be loving our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, help us not look for loopholes to serve you less, because there is no less. It is all or nothing. Lord, I pray for the folks here in the congregation, those on Facebook Live, that they would consider their own hearts and lives, as indeed I must do so today. Lord, your word pricks my heart. Lord, it motivates me to change my thinking and look at things differently from another perspective, not just from the comfort of self-justifying who I am and what I've done, but rather who you are and what I can do, Lord, to love you and others above myself. Lord, we just thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name. Right now, over the altars, if you want to come to the altar and, and talk to the Lord a few minutes, you can do that. You can space out around the altars. There's plenty of room. You can pray where you're at right now. Uh, if you're listening to me on Facebook Live and you're a believer, maybe some area of your life's been touched by God's Word today. Maybe you're listening today and you don't know Christ as your Savior. Whether you're here in this room or or, or on the Facebook Live, you can know Christ today. It's just very simple. With all of your heart, come to Him and repent of your sins. Ask Him to forgive you and cleanse your heart from all unrighteousness. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for your sins, and, and you believe that He bodily resurrected three days later, and that He's alive, seated beside the Father in heaven, and that He's Lord of lords and King of kings, and ask Him to be Lord and Master. Savior of your life today. Are you willing to surrender everything to God or are you wanting to keep parts of your heart and parts of your actions and parts of your words to yourself and, and not give it all up today? If you're not willing to give it all up, you really can't know him or follow him. I know that doesn't seem okay to a lot of people, but God doesn't like compromise. Somebody said they're kind of on the fence and the devil says he owns the fence. If you're on the fence, you're in the wrong place. God wants us all in. What does that look like? Our life today, fully devoted to him. I promise you, God continues to show me things in my life. So we keep making changes. We deal with the one thing God's dealing with us now about. And we change that. And God will come to something else because he's making you and I. Everybody that's born again is transforming us into the image of his dear son. Why well, do you want to be more like Jesus? To be more like Jesus, we have to act like Jesus. With his help, the power of the Holy Spirit, his love and compassion is possible. Amen. God bless you.